Hey, what's up, man? Great to see you again. I think this is the second week in a row where uh, I've, I've got back in the morning and then have to record a podcast. I, I don't want to say it like that. I have the opportunity, opportunity. to record a podcast an hour, hour go. and a half later. So here we are. But I will say one of the nice things, we've got a chiropractor who makes house calls. And so uh, we had it scheduled so that he would come this morning. So I got home, had a little chiropractic session, and here we are podcasting. Oh, I, I thought we were going to do the session right now during the, uh, during the chiropractic session, no, bro. Podcast. I fall asleep. <laughs> I fall asleep during the chiropractic session. So I would be, I would be useless at that point. That's funny. Yeah, man. Cool. Cool. And you just got back from, uh, what's the event called? Knock total or ar- total, total archery total challenge. Pack. That's right. Pack. Yeah. So, uh, just kind of imagine golf for archers. It's a little bit of golf. <laughs> They take you up the, the course, which is usually in the mountains. So this time it was in Park City and they take you up on the lifts and whatnot. And then you just walk down and work your way down through 20, 25 targets varying from 30 yards away up to, I think 110 maybe was the furthest one. Uh, yeah. And then you try to, uh, try to hit foam. So it was a good time and you get to hang out with cool people, which is always nice. And for the people that are really bored, you just hopped on a, like a downhill mountain bike and just try to bomb down the mountain without getting hit by an arrow just for that. We had some mountain bikers that were kind of coming through, but they had it marked off pretty well. But then there was some other oh, people okay. that were riding horseback through, through the course. It's like, you might not want to be doing this today. Somebody sees a big antlerless elk and shoots a horse in the ass would be uh, just, just a wonderful way for the weekend to go. I'm sure. Yeah. That's funny. Cool. How did you do? How, how did you, uh, what did you golf? I usually you score. Usually most people, most amateurs, I would say anyways, they judge their performance based on how many arrows they lost is usually how it goes. I see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like balls that you've lost in golfing. Yeah. Uh, so I think I lost, I think I lost two arrows. I lost one arrow, one arrow just broke and shattered. And another one, uh, I lost the knock popped off. It hit the dirt and the knock popped off. So, you know, I, I did, I did three different courses. So to say I lost two arrows, I, f- I feel pretty good with that. That's, That's not actually. bad. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. When I golf, I don't end up with the same ball. I, I think I usually lose about maybe 10 in a nine the, hole. <laughs> the way that I do it in golf, I measure whether I'm above or below par is based on how many I lose versus how many I find. So if I lose five, <laughs> but I find four, I'm one over par. Yeah. It's so if, if you're distracted mid golf and you're in the pond trying to find balls, you're trying to, you're trying to win. I'm trying to <laughs> fix my score doing. a little bit. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's funny. well, good, man. Well, we got, I posted, uh, or, or asked for some questions on the, uh, the gram and, uh, we got some good questions and some other questions. So we'll, uh, we'll answer the good ones. And, uh, if you would guys make sure speaking of Instagram that you're following tagging, sharing tagging is a little difficult hit or miss because they're, I, I was going to say shadow banning. It's not shadow banning. They're outright just, just going banning. right at us or after the jugular yeah. here. So, uh, you can check it out there, Facebook, Twitter, all at Ryan Mickler. I'm on Gitter, which is a new thing. I'm at Ryan Mickler, YouTube at order of man. Like, let's diversify where you guys are connected with me because it's very easy um, as evidence over the past month or so uh, that one of these could be shut down for any arbitrary reason. And that's what's happening. So just make sure you're following me on all the platforms and uh, we've got the content there. Copy. And we'll do our best. We're, we're kind of ad hoc grabbing these questions. So hopefully if I, if I grab, we're not going to, we're not going to grab one of the bad ones. We're going to do the best. (laughs) Okay. If I grab a bad one, we'll just call the guy out and say, bad question next. I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. All right. That's so funny. All right. Are you ready? Yep. Let's do it. All right. Gringo. Oh, he was one of the bad ones. Okay. Next. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> I don't even know this question. All Actually, right, go, well, it wasn't much of a question. So it's, it's more of a kind of an all over all around. So we'll see if it's a talking point for you. So uh, gringo. Requino. No, it's not a question. Is it the Vax anti-Vax current event? Yeah. Oh, that, that's not even a any, question. Any Next. take on it? No, I mean, <laughs> all right. Again, we talk about it all the time. The quality, the quality of your life of will question. be determined by the quality of questions you ask. You ask, well, this wasn't even a question. Uh, and it's amazing too, too, how many people can't follow simple instructions. That's what's amazing to me. It's like, I, I realize you want the perspective, but like ask a question and then we can give you a very specific answer. Uh, but this applies not just to what we're doing here. I'm trying to tell you this because 
this applies to the rest of your life. That's so much more important than what we're doing on this podcast. If you go into uh, uh, in an interview, for example, you might want to come out with some very poignant questions that you can ask the person who's interviewing you. If you're going on a date or uh, you want to learn more about somebody or you're hosting a podcast, get better at asking questions. Anything else is taking out. It's either a little bit of ignorance. And I don't say that with any yeah. ill intent. It's just a little ignorance uh, or it's lazy. So we can fix both of those. Yeah. And, and well, in this question, I'm kind of like, you know, maybe they're new people, right? Maybe they've jumped onto the order of man. Right. And that's where the ignorance, recently. that's where the ignorance. Yeah, and again, so, I don't so say that with ill better. intent. I'm saying it yeah. that. So, so this is the learning opportunity. Ask great questions and you'll get better answers that you're looking for. Yeah. All right. David Osbernson, do you think it's a duty for us men to train our minds and bodies to protect the people we hold dear to us? I don't think so. I don't think you should train your body. I don't think you should train your mind. I think you should just be fat and lazy and sloth. And satisfied and with covetous. who you are. Yeah. Be comfortable with who you are. Body positive movement. Um, don't let anybody tell you that you're not good enough. That's what I do. And it seems to work out pretty well for me. Yes, of course. Brian Mitchler. Of course. Train your <laughs> body. You, ha you have a moral obligation and responsibility to train your body and your mind. Uh, and if you're not going to do it, just be prepared for results less than you're capable of. You want great results, then you've got to be deliberate. You've got to be intentional. You've got to train for it. And uh, you got to make it happen. So I would say the answer to that is most definitely Absolutely. yes, of course. Yeah. All right. 5X. Back You're striking story. out on these questions, bro. I know. I, tell you. I know. All right. Come on now. Give me a good one. All right. I'm a police officer who works 12 hour shifts, seven out of 14 days. Maybe it's not me selecting the questions. Maybe just all these questions suck. No, it's you. Cause I saw some of the right. questions and I there's thought some... there's some good questions in here. Okay. Well, I'm having a hard <laughs> time finding them. <laughs> all right. This guy works seven out of 14 days. Yeah. Works 12 hour shifts out of 14, 12 shifts, seven out of 14 days. So I've started training jujitsu three days a week and I train and I try to run three to five miles, three days a week. I also have to take care of the house and yard. You've talked a lot about family time uh, or finding time for fitness and career goals. How do you make sure you're investing enough time in family? Is there a minimum number of hours in a week? There, I mean, look, there's not a minimum number of hours. So what you're falling into the trap of is this work-life nonsense, balance, this work-life yeah. balance nonsense, right? Where, yeah. where people assume that means equal distribution of priorities and responsibilities and obligations and tasks and things like that. And it isn't like that, you know, especially when you're working 12 hour shifts for seven days in a row or whatever. I didn't quite catch how that worked, but it's going to be more difficult, obviously for you to put in any real workout or spend time with your wife and kids when you're doing that, but that's what the job requires. So the way that you do it is not by measuring the hours that you're putting in, but you measure the results that you're achieving. If you feel distance from your wife, it's probably time that you consider putting in some more effort and making that a larger priority than something else. If you feel that your fitness is getting out of whack, then you need to start prioritizing that. And that's not to say that you completely abandon one priority or one responsibility so you can go all in on the other. There is a little bit of balance there, but the distribution of your resources, time, energy, attention, et cetera, are going to be determined based on the results that you're experiencing. If I'm struggling financially, well, I've got to get my ass to work and make sure that I make ends meet, or I may not need to pick up a second job to pay the debts off or make sure that the bills are paid, the roof over the head. If uh, I've, I've been so busy with work because personally I've been traveling so much, well, you know, it's, it's, it's important for me to take some time off, maybe even from jujitsu or maybe even from uh, extra work opportunities or another trip I could take and spend time with the family. So really evaluate the results that you're experiencing and then make your decisions based on that. You're out of whack right now because you're asking the question. So you just need to get that back in alignment with your priorities and get back on track. Tom Ward 101, what are some ideas for the rite of passage, uh, so to speak, for becoming a man? So ideas around rites of passage. Uh, anything that's going to have a level of competition involved in it, uh, a ceremony involved in it, suffering needs to be involved. 
Uh, it's got to uh, scare you. It's got to challenge you. Uh, it's got to push you outside of your comfort zone. It typically would involve something that you've never done or a skill that you're trying to develop, but there has to be hardship. There has to be a clear objective and there has to be some sort of a uh, ceremony or a ritual along with the completion of it. And that might just be you going to compete in jujitsu and the, the ceremony is you standing on the podium because you meddled in the, in the tournament. So that, that would be a form of a rite of passage. Uh, another rite of passage might be something like uh, Bedros Koulian's program or the Squire program that my son and I did, suffering mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, a lot of learning, a lot of hardship. And then at the end, we had the graduation dinner, even down to a certificate of completion for my son that he had framed it's up on his wall. I can see he's proud of that. It's a physical manifestation of the work that he's done. And therefore it would fall under the category of rite of passage, but it has to have those elements and those dynamics in order for it to, to qualify as a rite of passage. Got it. Uh, Anthony green. So I'm a new father. My daughter is two months old. I love every second of it, but I'm having a really hard time maintaining a consistent workout routine with all the randomness and lack of sleep that comes with a baby. Any tips? Squeeze it in where you can. So this goes back to the previous question about the irregularity of the schedule and the priorities. Of course, less sleep right now, heavy emphasis on wife and daughter, I believe he said. Of course, that's going to be the priority. It would actually be weird if it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> if other areas of your life were completely on par in light of you having your first child. So know that this is a season, but also make sure that you give yourself the space and the margin to take care of yourself. That might be very early in the morning, you know, after, after she's in bed or, you know, here's an, even another a good example of way to do this is look at her sleep schedule. And maybe once she's put down at, you know, seven o'clock or whatever it is, eight, I don't know, whatever you do. Maybe she sleeps really good for two hours. Okay. Well, there's, there's a two hour window right there. And you know what? I bet your wife would appreciate you leaving her the hell alone in that two hours. Cause she's up to here as well. If you are, she is probably even more so. So say, Hey hun, you know, at seven o'clock from seven to nine, that's personal time for you. I'm going to take from 7.30 to 8.30 and do a workout or go to jujitsu or get some things for the house so I can train here or go out into the garage or just go for a run or a hike. Uh, but look at what your schedule is and then work in your physical training where you can. Yeah. Yeah. You, and you might just need to be creative. I mean, sometimes totally. it, we have these expectations of what a quote unquote workout should look like. Well, maybe it's you taking the baby and going for a run and you get a running stroller and now you're a runner until things get back to normal. And it's a great way to get your child out and you know, you get active at the same time. So you just might I need definitely, to let go of some expectation. I definitely would not recommend doing any running, but yeah, anything other than that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm in pretty much agreement with you. Yeah. Yeah. Just baby, uh, kettlebell swings with your child. Maybe. Yeah. I, I'm not going to condone that behavior either. <laughs> But I won't uh, say I haven't done it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. All right. Uh, Eckert, 56. Name one skill, Mr. Mickler, you wish you had, but you do not. So, okay. So this is one of the questions I saw. And I actually like this question. I just, I was, okay. I was going to say, I kind of like it. I was thinking about it on the way home because I saw it. I, I made that post and I got in the car and, and drove. And so this is one of the questions that I saw before we hopped on here. Um, it is an interesting question. I will say it's hard for me to answer because I don't like the, the phrase wish ah, what's one, yeah. con what's one skill you wish you had. Cause I could say a million things, but that, why would I say that? I wish I could fill in the blank. Yeah. Well, just do it. Just yeah. do it. it so. If you wished it, you would have already acted on it. Or maybe what's a, what's a skill that you have not yet determined to develop. Or, or not, I would say the way that I, I think it should be framed is what's one skill you're going to work on. Fair enough. I like it. But in the spirit of the question, which I, which yeah. I understand, um, you know, I've thought about it a lot, like get, playing the guitar is one that I was doing, but I stopped doing that. So I wish I had better skills with that. Uh, 
again, jujitsu, but again, I'm, I'm working, I'm actively working to develop those skills right now. Better learning how to better communicate all of the skills that I have, that I, that I have a desire to develop are things that are actually, actually going to move the needle for me that are going to push me in the right direction. And all of the things that are important to me currently are the ones that I'm actually working on right now. So let's take the guitar thing. I could say, I wish I could play the guitar better, but I'm not practicing. So what right do I have to say, I wish I could be better. So there's like a huge disconnect. And I'm not saying that he thinks there is, but I think there's a lot of people out there who do think that, Hey, just wishing it or just hoping that somehow it's going to move the needle for you. Let's do away with the whole wish type thing and say, what are you actively doing? What is actually important to you? So playing the guitar, frankly, is not that important to me right now. If it was, I'd be doing it and I'm not. So therefore it's not as important as maybe I let on to believe or even lie to myself about whether it's guitar or something else. Yeah. Uh, but I will say one other thing I thought about is I wish that I was more mecha- mechanically inclined. That's something mm-hmm. that I'm not at all. I don't know vehicles or any of that stuff. And I actually really, it doesn't bother me, but it would be nice to be able to have some, some uh, mechanical knowledge when it comes to vehicles and cars and that sort of thing. Yeah. I actually, I'd put that one on my list as well. Yeah. I, I wish I was a little bit more mechanically inclined. Yeah. So there it is. Got to do something about that. All right. Seth. Um, no, I'm not going to read that question. All right. Codename Kentucky <laughs> recommendations for a beginner archery hunting bow. You know what I would do is I would just go into your local archer or uh, archery shop and I would, I would just tell them, Hey, I'm brand new. I've never picked up a bow or I did, you know, 20 years ago. I don't know what the technology is and just ask them. And usually what they'll do is they'll help you figure out your draw length, uh, your draw weight. They'll also, uh, give you some basic instruction. They probably even have some bows there that you can practice on and try and see what feels right. So that's the best thing that you can do it's same thing with a firearm, by the way, a lot of guys will say, what's the best firearm. There's a handful that I would suggest are, are good everyday carry type firearms, but just go to the range, go to your la- local gun dealer and tell them here's what's going on. I'd like to try a couple of different pistols, see what's going to work best for me or my hand size. Like I, my everyday carry is a Glock 43. It's a, it's a small compact single stack Glock nine millimeter. Well, a lot of guys can't use it because they have big, way bigger hands and I have pretty small hands. So like it actually fits into my hand pretty well. It's not going to work for everybody, right? So you actually have to go get your hands on it, try it out. Um, outside of that, I would go with a friend too. Always go with a friend because they're going to offer insight and value, but these are people you're also going to shoot with. So it's good to go do that stuff yeah. together. You can hit the range together, uh, but that's what I would suggest for whether it's a gun or a bow, anything like that. Do you guys typically increase their draw? Uh, is it draw weight? Um, over time, because as you shoot archery, you're getting stronger and then you need to increase or is it not that way? And it's no, it it is that way. It's not that you're getting, I mean, technically, yes, you're getting stronger, but it's the specific muscle group. And it's not even that it's the specific muscle group that's getting stronger. So I've, I've got a bow. I shoot about 70 pounds is the draw weight that I shoot. And for somebody who's never picked up a bow, I, I could take an individual. Have you shot a bow much? Yeah, no, not much, but okay. I shot one so, a few times. So you're, you're just as strong as I am, maybe a little bit less probably, but <laughs> let's just for the sake of argument, say that you and I are about the same strength. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hypothetically. Yeah. Yeah. In this, this hypothetical <laughs> world, you, you might, you're going to have a more difficult time pulling back my bow than I am because of the, the it's a weird movement when you're like stabilizing yeah. with one hand and pulling the other. It's just a weird movement that people don't do a lot. If you row, that's probably going to help. It's just a weird movement. So I've talked with guys and had guys actually shoot my bow who are just as strong and capable as I am. And they can't even pull my bow back. Hmm. So usually what guys will do is they'll start lower and you can get a bow that has a range. So it might, you might start at 50 pounds, for example, and, and you should like every man should be able to pull that back. And so you draw the 50 pounds, 
work up to 55 and it has a range. So it might be that, that particular bow might have a draw weight range of, you know, 50 to 80 or something, but every bow is a little different. So you need to work through that, but yeah, usually you're going to start lower and work your way into a higher poundage. Yeah. And, and through that question, we just got like a little bit of inside tip. If do not get a bow less than 50 or you're going to get made fun of, it sounds like, <laughs> I mean, you're not, I'm not going to make fun of, but my, Other my 13 will. year old kid can <laughs> is pulling 50 pounds. So right. every man, I, I'm not saying that demeaning. I'm just saying every man should, should have no problem with 50 pounds. All right. But, but honestly, like I'm registering that, right? Like the, I would not, if I showed up at your house to go shoot and my draw weights 40, you would make fun of me. You'd be like, I totally oh. would. hundred <laughs> yeah, percent. Totally. Well, we've got right. four or five Hoyt bows here that we run with our, for our events. And I'll have to yeah. look cause I haven't written down, but I think the draw weight is between 50 and 55 pounds up to 65 to 70 pounds on all of those on all of them. There's different. Okay. I so I know four. I can pull 50 cause I pulled yeah. one of those. Yeah. There isn't, there isn't one less than 50 pounds. So you're safe, brother. You're safe. <laughs> Done. All right. Just checking. I'm going to mess with you. I'm going to crank them up to 80 and say, they're only yeah. 50. <laughs> what the hell? You can't pull that back. <laughs> oh man. Uh, geez. These are these, you, you found good questions in here. These are horrible. Uh, okay. Here's good. <laughs> Have you ever thought of competing in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Yeah, I have thought about that. I haven't, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely a consideration. I think there's a lot of learning. You could tell me more cause I know you've competed, but yeah. I think in a short period of time, you, you learn a lot and you really see how you stack up against somebody that you never trained with potentially. So there's a lot to be said for that. So yeah, I think yeah. I probably will at some point. Again, yeah, I think it's priorities great because, measurement. Well, look for me, this comes down to priorities for me to take a, a Saturday to go do like go do a tournament is probably not going to happen because I don't want to give up one of my Saturdays. Either I'm traveling, doing something with a podcast, or I'm here with my family. And I don't know. I will tell you one thing I got jaded on in high school with wrestling and maybe jujitsu is different. And I'm sure each tournament's a little different. Yeah. They are so poorly run and managed that it infuriates me. It's like, people are sitting around, you got 10 mats and only one match going on at a time. You got to wait for 17 effing hours before your next match. I, I am such an efficient person and somebody who really values efficiency. Like there's, there's convenience stores in town. I won't even go to because I get infuriated with the way that they run it. So I'm like, I can't, I, I can't go into that store. I don't know if the tournament's the same way, but I just do not want to play that game. Yeah. It depends on the promotion. Of course. Some, some, some are course. actually well organized. Other ones are horrible. Right. Yeah, for sure. All right. Let's find one of these good questions. I mean, we got stuff like, do you like a Yeti cooler? Do you like the song purple rain? I mean, like, I don't even know where you guys came up with this stuff. Okay. Book recommendations for my 10 year old son, Jofo prime. Uh, I was, when you said Jofo Prime, I'm like, what is, what does yeah. that mean? I didn't know. That's that the guy's name. name. Yeah, yeah, got it. Uh, Ten-year-old son. Jocko's books, Way of the Warrior Kid series are really good. I think that's a great age range for a 10-year-old. Another one that of my personal favorites is Hatchet. That's a really good one. Jack London's got some amazing books. Uh, there's awesome books for for kids, for boys, but they should involve adventure and risk uh, Mark Twain, of course, you know, like there's, there's awesome stuff out there. So I would say, have it uh, be an adventurous, have some risk-taking, um, manly stuff like hatchet, like trying to survive in the wilderness. Like all of this stuff is, is awesome. But there's three or four for you right off the bat. There you go. Any, you would Sean, add kit? No, I, the first ones that came to mind is way of the warrior kid. Yeah. Uh, I, I love those books. In fact, my, my series. daughter's like going through, I think we're starting them over again because she wants to read them again. Cool. So, yeah. Um, all right. Shauna, Shauna Clayton, uh, some recommendations on people to who follow on Instagram that you would recommend. I, I don't, I mean, just whoever you like, like, I don't know. Um, I personally follow, I don't know. We follow all the same people. Just go through my recommendations list. We follow all the same people. Yeah. Don't follow yeah, that kind of guy though. Yeah. I mean, that's the cool thing. So here's, okay. 
I'll give you some practical advice. If you want to find people to follow on Instagram, what you do is you go in and you type in Instagram, you go to the search bar and you type Ryan Mickler or whoever, hypothetically, that's what you type in there. And then you click on my name and you click on the little following button right there. And you can see everybody that I follow. So here's the first few that come right off the top. Sean Whalen, uh, Andy Frasilla, Andy Stumpf, Madison Cawthorn, follow of court Pete Roberts and Origin, Jack Donovan, uh, Sal Frasilla, Evan Hafer, Chris Gatchko, Bert. I mean, guys, Granger Smith. I'm not going to read them all to you. Just find who you like, whoever you resonate with. Let's say it's me or Pete or, 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 or Andy or whoever. Just click that follow button. Instagram's made it easy to see who you should follow. Zuby is another one. He's coming on the podcast here in the next month or two, but they're, they're all on there. Bedros, Kulian, they're there. It's kind of like uh, the Google search function. You can take advantage of it, but you gotta, gotta get after it. All right. Next question. Um, RDB smiles. Hey, Ryan, really would love to hear your thoughts on uh, when building a business restaurant chain, possibly, do you prefer to bootstrap? Uh, what if there are no funds in, to bootstrap small business loan after developing a business plan or trying to find an investor always feels like you need the money to make money. Although I think that there's also probably an excuse. It, it might be, but there, it also depends on the business. So my business, for example, is, very low investment required. When I started, I had a $70 microphone, an old computer, an old office chair and desk. uh, And that's really it. (laughs) So, and, and I think I paid 15 bucks a month to host my podcast on Libsyn. That's really all that I had. So if it's that kind of business, even with t-shirts, you could have a, a, a printing business that they'll just print one-off shirts as they're ordered. Now you're not going to make as much doing that, but at least you can try. You always talk about it, Kip, that minimum viable product. And you're not having to buy 200 shirts at a time, having them sit in your house and then not being able to sell a dang one of them. So now you're talking about a potential restaurant chain. Okay. If you need to buy into a franchise, obviously you have to have the capital. If you're talking about starting your own restaurant, which I don't know that I would recommend. I would definitely find a business partner and or investor on that, somebody who's already done that because that's a crazy business from what I hear. Then some capital is probably going to be required because you're going to need to buy machinery and cooking equipment and re- cash registers and booths and tables and chairs and the space. And then you're going to have to do a build out on the space. And so if that's what you want to do, having an investor or having some capital is going to be a requirement. But just be smart. You use your head. Don't get overly emotional. Don't turn whatever it is, your idea into this sacred cow that you just won't touch or won't look at from a rational, reasonable perspective. Mm. You're going to be excited about that. That's good. You should be excited about it. But if that's the only factor, your level of excitement, then you probably have some blind spots and setting yourself up for failure. So more so than asking me, if you should have capital or no capital or bootstrap or get an investor is you should really talk with somebody who's been hyper successful in the industry that you're trying to go into. And I've never owned a restaurant and I have no desire to own a restaurant. So anything that I told you would be, well, would just be unqualified advice. So find somebody that's done it, ask them that question. That's the better way to ask that. Yeah. If you don't mind me sharing, I think, um, I'm going to slaughter the story a little bit, but a friend of a friend uh, started a a chain here in, actually, I think it's in multiple states in the Midwest um, or in the Southwest called Sweeto Burrito. And the way he started that chain, it was a food truck in North Dakota. Right. Great point. Great point. It It was a food truck that everyone loved. And then they bought out the food truck company and made it into a, a, a restaurant chain. Great point. MVP. Yep. Right. So uh, there's, there's some strategies. And, and I think too, like if I came to you, Ryan and said, Hey, I, I want to open up a food restaurant chain or whatever. And I don't have anything to show you. That's going to be unique about this restaurant, <laughs> or that's going to be a hard decision for you to invest totally. in my quote unquote idea. If I don't have something right yeah. to prove that it's going to be a valuable or it's, you know, people like it or, or, or whatever. So 
Yeah, there's another example, as you said that, because that's a really good story. There's a place uh, a couple of miles from here, and they probably just rented a space from whoever owns the complex next to them. It's this big empty parking lot. And they poured a bunch of gravel and they have a trailer that they pulled in and it's a semi-permanent trailer now because they've done a little yeah. build out, but it's clearly a trailer, but they did a build out and built, you know, frame around it and whatnot. And I imagine the way that I see it going, and I've actually never been there, but if that place does well enough that the next thing you'll see is you'll see a, maybe a little bit more of a permanent structure, or they'll move from this place to this other place and they'll start leasing yeah. an, an actual space, like you said, and then it'll grow and grow and grow and then they'll have their next thing and so on and so forth. So there are ways to do that. I'm just not qualified to, to share them, but that is a great point you bring up. Uh, Charles William, I know you lean conservative, but are there certain liberal values you wish the right would embrace and adopt? Uh, I mean, I, I would say that anymore, I'm more of a libertarian more so like just yeah. leave everybody alone and let them to their devices. I'm, I tend to be a pretty black and white guy. So I mean, maybe if you had some policy that you would consider a liberal policy, I would be able to more specifically tell you, yes, I agree or no, I don't. But generally, I just want to be left alone. Um, I want the government to deal with our border security and our nation's defense and pretty much want to be left alone to do what I want to do outside of that. And I think other people should as well. So whatever side of the aisle an issue falls on, it's probably going to be that. Leave us alone. Let people make their own decisions. Now, I believe in law and order. Of course, I believe that there needs to be some rules. I also believe that there should be a level playing field. Now, that that's e equality under the law, not necessarily equity, which is equal outcomes. I don't yeah. believe in that. Everybody's different. Kip, you and I are different. And even if we were twins and we were raised the same way, our outcomes would be different because of the way that we think and experiences that we have individually and collectively or the way we determine them and interpret them. So equal, equal, uh, equality under the law. And outside of that, again, protect our borders, defend our nation, let States make their own decisions about education, abortion, some of these other issues, and then just let people make their decisions period. Got it. Alec M. Falk, as a follower of Christ and building my own financial planning business almost five years in, I'm trying to make this shift from depending on, uh, make this shift from depending on me less and on God more. In the Bible and church, we say that it's all up to God, but I still have to do the work. In the past, I have worked like it was all up to me and the stress I put on myself through was not healthy or sustainable. Now that I have given my business and the success that comes with it to God, I feel the weight has been lifted off my shoulders and I have a better business and relationship with God. Do you ever make that shift in mindset to depend more on God and, and release high self expectations? My philosophy is this, and I'm a Christian, but my philosophy is this. Do what you can, do good, and go as hard as you can and let the chips fall where they may. I believe that if I do everything that I individually can, I work hard, I do what's right, I strive to be a good and decent human being, I work to make myself more capable, it's going to be inadequate, and I feel like God will make up the difference for me. My fear mm -hmm. for so many people who are Christians is that they do it the other way around. I'm just going to rely so heavily on God and God and God. And he's going to do this. He's going to do all these things. He's going to make my wildest dreams come true. And I don't have to do anything. And they've got it backwards. And I would suggest to you that God says, you do everything that you possibly can to be a good and decent human being, to make yourself more capable. All the things I just said, and I will make up the difference. And I acknowledge his hand in all things. Even look, even the things that I personally do, for example, I feel like, I run a pretty good podcast. So it'd be easy to say, I did this. I built this. No, I didn't build this. I have talents and gifts and abilities and opportunities 
uh, and a mindset and experiences that were all presented to me through him. And I've been able to capitalize on those opportunities, but look, I'm healthy. Maybe I already have the predisposition to be a great communicator or to be a great networker or to be curious. Those aren't things that I necessarily developed. I sure I have a little bit, but there might just be some of that inherent in my personality. And I acknowledge his hand in that. So we need to be mindful of using the talents, gifts, abilities, and opportunities that he has presented, doing all that we can with those opportunities and gifts, and then being understanding that he's going to fill in the blanks. And also this, here's another thing. We don't always know the plan. So you might be doing everything that you possibly can to grow your business or to fix that relationship or whatever it is you're working on. And the result doesn't turn out the way that you would like it. And it would be easy to say, I've done everything. Why don't you help me and, and forsake him in that moment? It would be easy to do that. And in fact, I have done that. And then you fast forward five years and you look back at that experience. You're like, oh, got it. What I wanted wasn't what he wanted for me. And so he was preparing me for what I'm into right now. That's my take. Yeah, I like it. All right, Xavier Morgan, how do you, uh, what do you do when your profession no longer aligns with your values? I'm an active duty Marine and I have a few buddies who wonder the same thing. Our job takes us away from our families for long periods of time. I have always thought that being a good Marine would make me a good husband and father and vice versa. I completely agree with your take on work-life balance, but the nature of the job does not allow for that, which is why I'm considering switching professions, but I can't seem to let go. Would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Look, there's probably some reasons. So as a, as a Marine, there's probably some reasons that you're having a hard time letting go because there's a lot of value that comes from that, that you still align with. And yeah. you've been, I'm trying to think about the way to say this. I'm, I'm trying to be selective with my words. I'll just say it this way. You've been conditioned to be loyal. That from, right? Marine Corps, you're a Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Like you have been conditioned to be loyal. And there's nothing wrong with that. But once you start to see that your current trajectory is not serving you or the people that you care about or is not in alignment with your values, you make the simple, not easy, the simple choice to move into something that is going to be more in alignment with your values and your goals and your objectives. It's that simple. It really is. And so we complicate it and we think, oh, you know, am I quitting? What are the guys going to think of me? Or I have this, you know, package I've got 12 years in now I got to, I'm almost eight years away from retirement. And so we suffer needlessly because we allow some factors to, well, we give those factors more weight than they should. So what I would suggest to you is that if you feel like it's no longer in alignment, whether it's the Marine Corps or the army or selling insurance and investments like I was doing, then you actively today, start today, work towards creating your next mission, whatever that is. So when I was doing the financial planning stuff, my next mission was order of man. I was building order of man while I was doing my financial planning stuff. And in the military, you have great options for transitioning and you've got time. You also have contracts that you may need to see all the way through to the end. But look, you've got a window right now. So take advantage of this window because the last thing I want to have happen, and this goes for any military member, is for them to hit retirement or decide that they're going to leave the military and not really have a strategy moving forward. A lot of military members do that and it tees them up for failure because they feel worthless. They feel helpless. They've lost the brotherhood. They've lost the camaraderie. They've lost the discipline in the structure that comes with the military. And they didn't take advantage of the time that they knew they were going to transition out to the time they're actually transitioning out. So be building something right now, be working towards something right now. Uh, and that transition, well, let me say it this way. Let me have you wrap your head around this. If you already knew what you were going to do when you got out of the military, like you already had a plan in place. He said, I'm going to move on to this thing and me and my buddies are going to grow this business or we're going to start this thing. Would you leave? 
if today if that was you had already the, in place, if the, if the plan was in place, you knew what it was going to be, would you leave? And the answer is yes. Right. I, I'm assuming based on the question. Okay. Yeah. So if the answer is yes, then all that's missing is the next step. You already know you want to transition now. You just need the next step. So take this time right now to build that out. So when the time comes, you'll be able to, to do it. Got to be. Uh, Dave River 15, any thoughts on bad selfishness and how to stop thinking about myself above other people's needs? I tend to be a pretty selfish individual. That's like my natural inclination is to yeah. look after me and mine and to hell with everything else. And sometimes I leave a wake of collateral damage in my path. Um, that's just how it's been uh, being 40 years on this planet. So it is something I personally need to be mindful of. And what I found is that if you can give yourself to a cause greater than you, that's very important, then you'll be less selfish. So order of man for me is that cause. I want to see men thrive. I want to see young men be able to transition successfully into manhood. I want marriages to thrive. I want you guys to make money and to be healthy and to live fulfilled lives. That's what I want. And because that's what I want, then I am more able to focus on other people. A great example is this morning. I could have very easily said, I don't want to do a podcast today, but it's too important for me not to do a podcast. Not for me, because I would have loved to sleep in. I'd love to see my family. There's a lot of things I'd, be, I'd love to do right now, but I'm here doing this podcast because I care about the work and therefore I'm going to sacrifice what I want in order to give you what I interpret or feel like you as men need who listen to this podcast. So maybe the reason you're selfish is because you haven't found or discovered or created anything more important than yourself yet. And if that's the case, that should be a red flag that maybe you're missing some meaning in your life. And yeah. I would be working very diligently to create and discover and uncover that meaning that will allow you to be less selfish. Yeah. If it's not obvious, right. The benefits is far more than just being less selfish, right? If you think about what comes with a purpose-driven life and, and making your time on this rock more valuable than just your own personal gain, I mean, obviously the, the results is far greater than just a, a refocus of time and effort. Well, and the ironic thing is that by serving other people in a meaningful and significant way, you actually get a lot out of it. I feel fulfilled. I feel uplifted. I have developed my own set of skills. I am making more money than I ever have, right? So it's a little backwards. It's a little counterintuitive, but I can tell you from experience as a, as a selfish person myself that when you serve other people in a meaningful way, it's inevitable that you will be served as well. Zig Ziglar said it best. If you help enough people get what they want, you will inevitably get what it is you want. So you can't, you can't separate the two. And I think a lot of people believe that like, oh, if I donate yeah. money or time or charity or resources or time or attention or energy, I don't get anything out of it or I don't get that back. No, it's actually an investment in yourself. It's very counterintuitive, but anybody who's given back and served or found a meaning or a purpose or a mission higher than themselves understands that they can't just extrapolate themselves from that equation. Yeah. All right. Dishy man, what is one good strategy to deal with and overcome distractions? Uh, I, I would make a plan. That's the most important thing you could do because if you don't have a plan, you're just going to get tossed to and fro and I don't know where to go. And Oh, there's that. Oh, this looks enticing. Oh, I can go to this yeah, event. Shiny oh, object of the people. day. Yeah. Right. Right. So if you haven't charted your course, if we're looking at a, you know, a, a, a ship, or, or, or you're going to you know, go to Disneyland with your family and you haven't charted that course of how you're going to get there, how do you decide what's the most effective way to get there? Well, you base it on what's in front of you at the moment. But what's in front of you at the moment is bright and shiny object syndrome, especially for people who have the, the tendency to go this direction where they're just so easily distracted. Formulate a plan for what you want. So one thing I know about the fitness industry is that 
a lot of guys will bounce from program to program to program to program because they're not experiencing the results that they want or they get bored or whatever. Okay, well, the best results you're going to experience is when you actually stick to a program for the prescribed period of time and complete the program. So you have to have a program and you have to stick with it. And if you commit to the program, in this case, you know, the plan of action, then you aren't going to be distracted by these things. They might be enticing, but you made the commitment. So if you're going to do 75 hard, for example, then do 75 hard. Don't do 32 medium and then get distracted by the next, next 60 day summer ab challenge that comes along. Like actually commit to what you're going to do, see it through. And then when it's done, you can evaluate it and decide, okay, I want to do that again, continue down the course, or I want to try something different based on the results that I experienced or the results that I'm after. But chart your course, commit to that plan of action, and then only then will you evaluate. I did that when we started the podcast. I committed to doing a podcast every week, weekly, for two years. So that's over that's 100 what your episodes. personal commitment was to yourself. That was my personal was, commitment. I'm going to do this for two years weekly. Period. Period. And after two years, only after two years, would I then evaluate whether or not I wanted to continue to do it or not. Now, that's not to say that I didn't evaluate it along the road to make it better and improve it and yeah. see where I could get enhance the quality of things. But I, did, I wasn't going to throw in the towel until two years. We did the same thing when we moved to Maine. My wife and I talked about it. We said, we're going to give ourselves two solid, fully committed years in Maine. Like not dipping our toe in the water, not like seeing. No, we're going all in for two years. And after two years, then we'll evaluate whether we want to stay or whether we want to go. But we, com- we had a plan of action. We we're both on the same page about it. We committed to the course of action. And in both of those examples that I gave you, it actually ended up turning out pretty favorably. And I would argue that if you do it that way, it's going to turn out more favorably than not. If you create the plan of action and you commit to the plan of action and you see it through to the end. Yeah. Uh, Sam Broadway had a similar question. So let's see if you'd add anything to what you're saying. He says, what metric do you use to personally, uh, what metrics do you personally use to track your own success? And this is a, a good um, or we can talk about battle plans and whatnot, but go ahead. Yeah. It, and to your point about battle plan, tracking your success really depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So uh, income is certainly a, a metric that I, that I evaluate. How's, how's yeah. the business doing? Uh, how, how's the income? How's the debt to income? All that stuff. I track all of that. So that's an important metric. I'll look at my personal accounts and my investments and I'll track that. Um, I look at just the quality of the relationships that I have. And that is a little more difficult. And I tend to be more intuitive on that. Like I'll ask myself, how is my relationship with my wife right now? It's good at, in the not too distant past, it was disconnected. So I ask myself, how is this relationship? Oh, it's disconnected. It feels like I'm living with a roommate, not my my beautiful bride. So what can I do to change that? So that's a more intuitive answer that I look at. Um, but the hard data is easy. You know, you look at podcast downloads, you look at income, you jump on the scale, you look at your, your, your deadlift and how much you're lifting or not lifting. Those are easy. It's the soft ones typically in, when it comes to relationships that are more challenging. Um, and I tend to be more intuitive. How does it feel? Does it feel on track? What are the pain points? What are the issues? What can you do to improve it? And through asking yourself those questions, you start to unpack some plans of action moving forward. Yeah. And I think uh, at least on the business side, one thing that has really been present for me of late is just making a distinction of leading indicators, right? Like I, Mm. it's good Mm. to understand where, uh, how we are succeeding, but what are the leading indicators that led to that success and, and let's now have some metrics and some KPIs around those. So then that way we ensure that we're succeeding, right? Right. Basic way of looking at this is leads, opportunities, and projects, right? It's like, okay, for us to have that much business that required these many closed opportunities and those closed opportunities required this many leads. So now let's put some indicator indications and metrics around those leads, Jen. So that way we ensure that we have that 
proper level of leads and we just don't sit back and go, oh crap, business is slow. And now, you know, you're, you're too delayed, right? Because those are lagging indicators. So that's, I like that, but let's apply that also to your relationships. There's lead indicators in your relationship too, that you ought to pay attention to. Some people call them red flags or whatever, but there's indicators that are there. If you're in tune with it, you're paying attention that you'll see your wife will say something. She might just say it in passing or she might not say anything, but you just see a little shift in her uh, personality or your relationship together. Leading indicators don't wait until, and most guys will do this until you have a blow up, an argument, or even worse, go straight to separation or divorce or she cheats or you cheat. Catch those leading indicators as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I'm reading a book around troubled teens right now. And the same thing for children. There, there are red flags Definitely. that most, pe- most parents ignore because they're uncomfortable. And then before you know it, we have habits formed and we have a separation in relationships and we have you know drifting apart between child and parent because we didn't address the things up front. And there's a lot of uh, indicators there. I, it, it's, this is such an important topic because it's, we're talking about business and money and relationships, but it also applies to this country. You know, I've heard from a lot of people who say, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it's just this. It's just that. There's a lot of red flags that we as a country are, over, we, I should say we as citizens of this country are overlooking because we're saying to ourselves, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it's just this. Oh, it's just that. And so we're justifying the behavior. And then the precedent is being set that we're easily trampled. We're pushed around. We're manipulated. We're coerced. And we're not willing to stand up for ourselves. So it applies to our country. It applies to relationships. It applies to business. It even applies to your own personal goals and ambitions. You know, if you want to get locked in with your diet and nutrition, for example, and, uh, you know, you realize that, hey, late at night, and this is my struggle, I get bored a little bit. And so I like to eat. Okay. Well, that's a little red flag. It's not okay to do it. And you might say, well, it's okay. I've justified it. You know, I I worked hard today. That's one of the things I say. I earned it. Uh, It's just, just, just this, you know, just tonight, but tomorrow I'll be, no, none of that. Don't let that stuff in address it early and often. You'll be significantly better served if you do. And so will the people you care about. Another thing I had for Sam around metrics, um, within the Iron Council, we do our goal setting around um, a tooling called the Battle Plan, and which you can obviously read about within Ryan's book. But there's a couple of resources. If you go to store.orderofman.com, you can get a, a paper version of that Battle Plan. If you're like Ryan and you're like 80, 80 years old and don't feel comfortable using a computer and you have to use paper. I am an old, am an old soul, man. I really am. You could, Even as a kid, I always felt like I was like 50 years old. So all my friends yeah. would make fun of me. <laughs> so you could go paper out if you want to go that you store.orderman.com, or you can actually even get the mobile app uh, from the Apple store or Google play um, or just go to 12 week battle Uh, And you can purchase the app from there as well. And that's the tooling that we use within the Iron Council for like tracking our success and our metrics around what we're doing. That's right. Cool. Let's take a couple more. All right. Yeah. So uh, really digging. Actually, you know what? It's funny. I'm reading these questions. I'm like, okay, wait, there are some really good ones. Some of them are towards the bottom. So we're going to have to maybe come back to these next uh, next week. Uh, Sophia Lauren. Uh, a woman listener and question. We don't get these too often, or at least not questions. We're not, Are there not any good podcast answer? <laughs> only men. We don't help women. That's he, not he our man, focus. He man, woman hater club here. Just get his club. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. What does Sophia have? Let's hear it. All right. Are, are there any good podcasts out there that speak more to the mom's role on raising a boy into a man? We are welcoming our first son into the world any day now. I, I wish I could tell you, honestly, I don't know right offhand. I actually had a good conversation with a friend of mine uh, at Total Archery Challenge this weekend because she's considering starting a podcast. And I told her that this is, it's funny you ask this because I told her this is one of the most common questions I get from women. There's two questions I get from women. Number one, how do I raise my son as a single mother? Number two, where's the women's equivalent of what you're doing? And she actually touched on both raising sons and the female equivalent of what we're doing. I don't know if you guys have some great resources on that, please let us know. Uh, I, I wish I had a better resource. 
there's a lot of women out there that I've seen talking about this stuff, but it seems to me that the women who are doing this are more talking about how to grind, how to hustle, and it's all business related. And I don't talk about that all the time. There's a lot of Instagram things, a lot of podcasts that talk about men grinding and hustling and working. It's important. It has its place. But guys, like this, I want, I'm, I'm more well-rounded. At least I'm trying to be, and that's what I'm trying to give you. So I've, it's, it's been hard to find a woman who does that too, because a woman who's out there doing a podcast like this is going to, I'm trying to think about the best way to say this is she's going to be a little bit more masculine in her approach to life. I think just because of the nature of what she's doing, like she's going to get out there. She's a go getter. She's hustling. She's grinding. She's doing that. I would love to see a woman who is a stay at, excuse me, a stay at home mom, somebody who wants to be balanced, somebody who wants to raise her children and maybe does also have a career or not. That's what I'd like to see, but I, I haven't yet seen it. And I've been trying to convince my wife to do it for years and she won't. So, um, I do think, correct me if I'm wrong, if you agree or not, uh, I mean, you probably are. I mean, that's yeah. like, <laughs> but I think the boy crisis is a great resource. I, it, some of it's a little, maybe a little too, some of his viewpoints, I obviously don't agree with li- like politically, but the foundation that he lays of the dilemma that boys are raised into in our society and some of the dichotomies of being a boy or a man, I think is highly insightful. And I think that would be from a mother's perspective, you need to understand kind of this odd, I don't know, this odd society and world in which your boy's being raised in and what's being expected of him um, and asked of him in in a really unique way. And it is somewhat unique if you think about it. It's very interesting. I think that's a great point. Uh, There's also a book that came to mind as you said that, which is Wild at Heart. Yeah. Yeah if you want to understand why men are the way they are and what they do and what they're after as a mother, it seems like you're very interested in that. Then go read wild at heart. And here's what I would say. Don't assume or attempt to correct it. Okay. But Don't that, that's, it prob- wrong. that's probably yeah. what you'll be tempted to do. Well, that's not right because I feel this way, right? Because you're a woman and that's not wrong either. Yeah. But if you really want to strive to understand your boys, then don't take a great book like that and try to interpret it through your female vision. Just accept it, embrace it. You don't even have to fully understand it. You know, one of the premises in Wild at Heart, for example, uh, that, that is a question that every man or attempt, is t- attempting to ask himself is, do I have what it takes? Now, you might hear that as a woman and think, oh, well, they're measuring themselves on performance and how they... Yes. Yes. And you don't have to agree with it. You don't have to like it. You don't have to understand it, but it is. So the better that you can wrap your head around it and just embrace it for what it is, the more opportunities you can create for your sons where they can attempt to begin to answer that question in in the affirmative in their own lives. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nate Duffy morning, sir. My name is Nathan Duffy. I am 19 years old. I've been listening to the podcast for about two weeks now. And I got to say it has truly been beneficial getting the insight that you and your guests provide. With that said, I'm curious, how do you strive to maintain balance within your life on a daily basis as stressors go, uh, as stressors grow and kids, family work and the rest are introduced. I know a routine is crucial, but I just want to wanted some insights on how to do that. Thank you, sir. And have a great day. Yeah. So go back last week and the week before and the week before that we're always talking about work-life balance. And so this is, again, we've talked about it actually earlier today. This is the same thing that you're getting into. Yes. There's stressors. Yes. There's challenges. And I think you even use the term balance. Sometimes it's going to be perfectly distributed. And most of the time it's not going to be perfectly distributed. So I feel like a little bit, I answered this question in telling you that you ought to look at the indicators, look at the results when you aren't producing what you want in different facets of your life. That's where you make the pivots and reallocate your assets. Okay. When I say reallocate your assets, I'm talking about your time, attention, and energy. If so, as an example, struggling, Ryan, go ahead. 
Well, I, I want to make sure that I understand. So, I mean, are you saying, okay, I'm stressed out and the balance is, Hey, stop doing some work and get some, uh, some personal time or relaxed time in, or is it something else? And is it more meditation or is it more thoughtfulness? Like what is the balance to, to being stressed out with all these things going on? Get to the balance to being stressed out is get your shit done and don't commit to things that you get stressed out about anymore. Hmm. Cause I've been stressed out in my life. I'm a little stressed out right now because for the last three weeks I've been traveling. So I've been a little distant with our, our iron council, our brotherhood. I've been a little distant with my family. I haven't been able to hit all, all of my obligations and responsibilities the way I would have liked. I'm not hundred percent on those things because I've been traveling so much and I actually take great joy in meeting people and being out there and advancing what we're doing here. But I've done an after action review and I realize, okay, I can't travel this way or I can't do a podcast right when I get back from traveling. So I adjust the way that I show up in the future. So I don't create this unnecessary stress that I have in my life. I learned to say no more effectively. I put the boundaries in place I know how I'm going to feel and how I'm going to perform, which I'm not interested in doing. And so I correct the situation after you meet your obligations. Because what I don't want to have happen is because you're stressed out, you just let everything go. Okay. That's not manly behavior because you made commitments. You made agreements with people. They're relying upon you. So do what you said you're going to do, but don't continue to do that stuff. It's the same thing when it comes to being stressed out with the, the workload that I have, what I'm trying to figure out right now actively is how do I delegate this? And all right, guys, not sure what's going on with the technology, but we cut out again. So I let Kip go. Um, I think we got through most of the questions that we wanted to. So we'll get the technology on my end worked out. Uh, but just wanted to uh, cap this out, let you guys know I appreciate you tuning in and listening in. Make sure you share, subscribe, rate, review, uh, spread the good word, what we're doing here, reclaiming and restoring masculinity, and let's get after there and, uh, and, and be men. All right, guys, we'll be back uh, on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.